Hi guys, welcome to Blogspot's Blockchain in Business podcast. This is our first podcast of its kind in India and we're all very pleased to have you here. My name is Amit and I am the Blockchain Technology Evangelist at Arc Blockchain Solutions and will be your presenter today. The official presentation will start in a few minutes as more members join in. Cut. Hi guys, welcome to Blogspot's Blockchain in Business podcast. This is our first podcast of its kind and uh, we are all very pleased to have you here. My name is Amit and I'm the technology evangelist at Arc Blockchain Solutions and will be your presenter today. Now, before we get started, I'd just like to take this opportunity to tell you a little bit about us and how we got here. So back in 2014, when we were still in college, uh, a few of my friends and my co-founders now, uh, the SV and Vikyat, uh, we would get on a call on a weekly basis to discuss all the new technology and gadgets in the market. So it just happened that we all got talking about a small company based out of the Bay Area in US. This small company was using blockchain technology to bring in a customized solution to banks. Now, this is in a environment where everyone was saying that banks should be really scared of cryptocurrencies and banks are pretty much doomed because of blockchain. And here comes a company that was just focused on building solutions for the banks using blockchain technology and that really got our attention. So that small company was called Ripple Labs and now has a market cap of just under 14 billion US dollars. By then we had a based idea of what Bitcoin was, but this piqued our interest in the underlying technology which is blockchain. Through rigorous research and a lot of help from our resident tech wizard Vikyat, we were ready and confident to take on the blockchain industry. Back in 2015, it didn't take us long to understand the market wasn't in India yet, but it was booming abroad. Using our connections from our university, we got in touch with our friends in Seoul in uh, South Korea, and they helped us enter the space's most largest and most prominent segment, even to date, and that is cryptocurrencies. So we pretty much invested on the dual principle of focusing on the technology for long-term results with stable trading volumes. This simple yet effective strategy was what me and Tejasvi were able to outsource to our clients in terms of consulting in the blockchain-driven crypto asset environment. By September 2017, we had expanded from trading to architecture for several B2C products, exploring options to implement blockchain in their businesses. So armed with this experience in the Indian market and the ability to understand the scope of the technology at that point, we took on the task of moving away from cryptocurrencies and onto blockchain and its vast potential. Over 14 months of research and collaborations with industry experts has allowed us to host our first introductory podcast to the blockchain in business. The purpose of the webinar would be to introduce you to the base or layman understanding of blockchain technology, connect the benefits to real life use cases and glance over the various industries that can benefit from this technology. So let's get started. So the agenda of this podcast is going to give, again, like look at a base description. Now, we're not going to go into the technical aspect of it, but rather give you the ability to go ahead and explain it to a friend. So think of it in a way where uh, you have to explain a car to someone who's never heard of it. So you say that, hey, look, the car has four wheels. That's how it moves. It has an engine and you have a steering wheel where you can sit and steer the car in any direction and you have brakes so to stop the car. And the engine is what helps it move forward. So that's a very, very basic description. You don't really need to know how a car combustion engine works, you don't need to know how the drive shaft is connected to the crankshaft, uh, you don't need to know what are the dynamics of the transmission, but rather you can still give an explanation for how a car works. So that's what we're focusing on here, where you should be able to explain this technology to a friend who's never heard of it, but still not get confused by its technicality and all of the underlying uh, operations that go on to make this possible. Then we'll look at the participants of this technology and what are the benefits of this technology. Then we'll dive a little bit into private and public blockchains. And finally, we'll look at the blockchain applications, which is why you guys are here. So we talk about uh, a certain amount of industries, not all of them, of course, because there are a lot of industries to cover, but we'll talk about a few of them. And then we'll finally give an outlay of what blockchain looks like in India. So the final goal would be to provide, provide various business applications of blockchain technology. So let's get started with an introduction and we look at blockchain from a 10,000 feet view. So starting off with the history of blockchain, I'm pretty sure most of you guys know it, that uh, blockchain was founded by one Satoshi Nakamoto. He, she or they pretty much personified the idea of blockchain into what we know as Bitcoin today. So a system for basically uh, creating a payments channel, a P2P payments channel. So what is blockchain exactly? 
So we look at an example of A, B and C. So A, B and C are individual people who are looking to start their own company and they have to do a lot of transactions between each other. So in our legacy system or the current systems that we use, A, B and C would have one of two options. They would either elect a representative from their end saying that either A will keep track of their expenses or B will keep track of their expenses or only C will keep track of their expenses and they will, the rest of the parties will trust uh, this particular representative to maintain the integrity of the transactions. Or uh, a more popular method would be that they would go to a third party entity who is not really involved. So in this situation it would be a bank. But uh, again, you have to trust uh, the bank to maintain integrity of the transaction, then you also have to trust the bank or you have to trust this elected representing party or individual to keep all of your transaction data secure. So that's what uh, blockchain really aims to tackle by saying that, hey, look, you don't really have to go and trust a third party. Instead, what you can do is just go ahead and everyone keep track of the transactions and not just one party. So you're taking the accountability and you're decentralizing this accountability within all the people involved in this particular operation or this business. So how would this work? Basically, if A has to send $2 to B, so A would record that I have sent $2 to B. B would record that I have received $2 from A. But C, who is not really involved in this transaction, will also record this transaction saying that A has sent it to B. And this will continue for all time of transactions in case there's a new party that comes in say there's d who comes in d also has to start keeping track of all of the transactions that he is a part of or he or she is not a part of as well so that's pretty much how it works and it, it was created as a system of keeping track of expenses as i said it was a peer-to-peer -peer payment network but it's evolved into something completely different and that's what we look at right now but um Going back to the example, you can see that uh, if everyone's keeping track of the transactions, then you have a lot of transparency that goes on within the system because first of all, it is public uh, as every single person can see what are the transactions that's happening and every single person has the right to know what the transactions are happening so they can choose to record it. Secondly, it's decentralized so you don't really have a central repository of all the transactions that's going around but rather everyone has a repository so that makes it, um, you know, tamper proof because you can tamper with one of them, but tampering with all of the uh, ledgers or records would be really difficult. And thirdly, there is, a little, there is a lot of transparency in omitting the middleman because like I said, you don't have to go to a third party entity to make sure that your data is secure and your transactions are safe and they are recorded in a timely fashion and they also maintain integrity of the transactions. So you don't really have to trust them you, because in today, we don't really know how banks functions. They don't let their internal operations out to the public. And this is something that we don't have to go worry about under blockchain technology. Now, the second part of this is that if the entire system is public, then how is the security maintained of the system? So first of all, you have the aspect of trustlessness in the system, where you don't have to trust a single individual or a third party to say that, hey, look, you need to maintain, you need to make sure that uh, you don't act in a malicious way. So that component of transactions just goes away where you say that look we don't have to trust anybody instead that uh, we are all going to keep track of it and we are all accountable for making sure that uh, no one makes mistakes or no one acts in a way that's malicious towards us secondly all of this data is also encrypted that we'll touch upon later so that gives it an additional layer of security and third and most importantly it is privacy friendly so it does not work like conventional banks where you go ahead and open a bank account with your id and uh, you know for example example let's say that you have to give certain amount of documentation and verification before you can actually go and join their banks so that's not really required here because in blockchain technology you don't really have people's names or their account numbers to send it to but rather you have something like an address Think of it as a URL for a website, which everyone has and it's unique to them. And you, all you need is that particular URL or address to be specific to go ahead and send the funds or basically transact with that person over the blockchain network.
and finally and this is the most important benefit of it it is immutable so first of all it is driven by algorithmic security so there are secure hashing functions that come into play and make sure that this entire data is encrypted and stored in a secured way and this entire system is completely automated so people don't really have to worry about the encryption and decryption part of it the second and more important point is that all of the transactions are stored in a chronological order so going back to our example of abc if A sends two dollars to B, that would mean that B's total, uh, the value in B's wallet would be two dollars, and B can only send two dollars and not three dollars. So if B decides to send three dollars or B decides to send four dollars, B would have to first show where he received the additional funds from beyond the two dollars that he had from A, and that's very important because if B decides to send two dollars to C before B gets it from A. it's not possible in the blockchain network and that's pretty much how credit system works today and that is not allowed in the blockchain now this is a bit confusing for you don't worry about it because as in when we go uh, on with the podcast and as in when we talk about the business applications this will become a lot more clear and finally you have something called a universal domino effect so as you see that if b wants to send more money than he or she has they have to go and change the fact that a has actually sent them more money or they have to go and put in a false statement and saying that i have received so and so from this party and not only would they have to do it in uh, their record they'll have to do it in everyone else's record and since all of the transactions are public anyone can come and ask hey you got you are you saying that you got 10 dollars from x can you prove to me where x got their 10 dollars from so they will have to go in a chronological way and show that where x has gotten the 10 dollars from to send it to b and that again you will not only have to change in your record you have to change in everyone else's record so that makes it really really difficult for malicious actors to come into play so now that we have a clear understanding of what the benefits are from its features let's look at the value that it brings to current goods and services in the market today and to speak about this i'd like to take the example of a diamond industry so when you want to buy a diamond today you go on to a retailer and the retailer tells you that it's been mined from this quarry and it's been taken to this refinery and then it's been taken to this cutting facility and this grading facility and finally it's been given to you over here and you pretty much have to take the retailer's uh, word uh, as gospel because you don't really have an option of going ahead and validating what the person is saying but with blockchain if all of the uh, transactions of the particular diamond are stored on the blockchain then through a click of a button you will be able to see where it was mined you will be able to see where it has been refined you will be able to see where it's been cut you will be able to see where it's been graded and finally you'll be able to see who was the wholesaler that sent it to the retailer and now you're finally holding the diamond and all of this is completely automated and it's secure because there are multiple parties keeping track of this and not just one single repository so it cannot be that they will act in a malicious way and say that hey I'll just say that it's come from this quarry but it's actually from a low grade quarry and people won't know but you can't do that in blockchain because there are multiple people people keeping track of this and it could be even your competitors who are keeping track of this to ensure that if you do uh, try to act in a malicious way and if you do try to lie to your customers they can use that in a, as a usp to ensure that they have a competitive advantage so that pretty much gives it a uh, the whole aspect of tracking the origin and status of both goods and services and uh, you have dual benefits obviously first is that you can always charge a premium for uh, proving the authenticity of the particular goods or service and uh, second benefit is that you see a lot of data generation that is secure and tamper proof and this can be really used by companies to make their operations a lot more efficient so these are the values that come into play Now let's just quickly dive into the participants of this network. So who exactly are the guys who are part of this? So we can clearly define them into three particular categories and uh, I would like to take an example of a city, a bustling large city uh, that is representing the blockchain network for this example. So the city, the first thing that you do is that you create an authority body that makes sure that everyone who's part of the city is acting in a law abiding manner and they're making sure that their etiquettes are okay. and acceptable by everyone and they also ensure that no one is acting in a malicious way 
So the nodes are like the police in the blockchain network. They are pretty much responsible for making sure that no one's acting in a malicious way. They are responsible for keeping track of all the transactions that are going on. So by going back to our example again, where A, B, C, if B tries to send more money to C than B has, the nodes can definitely go and trace back and say that, hey, you don't really have that much money. You can't send it. You're trying to cheat and we will not allow you. And they ha also have the authority to ban people for a certain period of time or forever from the network, depending upon the magnitude of the crime then you have the normal users in the city the citizens the guys who are transacting goods and services with each other and they're pretty happy because blockchain makes it secure and easy to transact with each other and uh, these guys are all represented by uh, urls or addresses like we mentioned before and finally, you have the developers of the city. So the developers are the guys who go ahead and build the underlying infrastructure. So they build houses, they build roads, they build hospitals. And that's pretty much how developers work in the real world. But on the blockchain network, the developers are basically coders. So they go ahead and look at the underlying code. They make it easier. They make it faster. They also make it more secure. But the principal difference between real life and the blockchain city is that the developers cannot make a decision without prior approval from the users and the nodes. So the developers, if they want to build a building, they have to get the majority approval from the nodes and users to proceed with it. And without their approval, they cannot build it. So that's what creates a system of internal checks and balances where the nodes keep track of themselves and the users and the users ensure that the developers are acting in the best interest for the users and the nodes. So it's a very good self-regulating system that is automated in most ways. And so now that we have an understanding of the benefits and we have an understanding of the participants, let's look at it from a closer view. And I want to talk in particular about private and public blockchains. So those of you who would have read some articles here or there would have heard of the term private versus public blockchains. So they are different and we will talk about them in a bit, but I would like to start by talking about what's common between both of them. So what is common is consensus. The the ability or the mechanism that ensures that everyone is in agreement within the network is called consensus. So it's basically a democracy and consensus would be the voting mechanism. Uh, so that is common between private and public where a significant majority has to agree before a step can be taken. So public blockchains are basically uh, something where it's completely open for you to join. Anyone can come in and become a node. Anyone can come in and become a developer. Anyone can join the network as a user and start transacting. Private blockchains are the contrast opposite where, or stock contrast, I should say rather, where public uh, not everyone is allowed to join and not everyone is allowed to become a node and not everyone will be allowed to become a developer. So that's what private blockchains are. There is also a, a bigger definition or a distinction that's come in and it's more recent where it's permission versus permissionless blockchains. Now, permission blockchains are pretty much uh, where you have restrictions and barriers to entry, whereas permissionless blockchains are uh, where you don't have any restrictions or barriers to entry or participate or choose your role in the organization. So this kind of sounds familiar to the last slide because it is. It is just a term to confuse you and today there is no difference between permissioned and private versus permissionless and public. So they pretty much mean the same thing so now you, now you know and you will not get confused the next time you read this. So there isn't really a distinction now but in the future as more and more technologies come in uh, we should be able to make that distinction. So I like the, doing this chart because it makes it a lot easier for me to explain and a lot easier to understand as well. So if you're going for something that's completely public and completely permissionless where say all of the activity or the, or the records are publicly available and anyone can come in and join and become a node or become a user or become a developer. So then you're looking at something that's completely decentralized because there are no barriers to entry and it also attracts more people to come in who are looking for a decentralized network and people who are blockchain aficionados will tell you that the core of blockchain is decentralization. So this is probably the most popular form of uh, or adaptation of blockchain technology you will see in the recent years. Then let's go for something that's still public uh, and it's still permissionless but it's on the fringes of private. So how would this something like this look? So uh, a system like this would basically show 
the records to the public but say that uh, you know you're free to join but you have to get validation from all of the nodes before you can become a node so it's permissionless still in the way that you can still join the network it's public because all the records are available but it is private because you cannot become a node now this is something that's completely transparent because you first of all have the ability to store that data in multiple locations because it's a public system where people can join and you are also showing the records online so people who are not part of the network can go ahead and check the records so that creates a you know enormous level of transparency but at the same time you're protecting the people who are putting the data forward so you're controlling that aspect of it then you have something that's uh, private and it's permissioned but it's still public so that would be something like where uh, the records are public but uh, participants in the network are restricted and your ability to become a node is restricted by various factors. So that's something that's privacy friendly and this is something that would be very beneficial for enterprises and private institutions because they can ensure that they have the component of decentralization but also ensure that uh, only their stakeholders are participating in the network. And finally, you have something that's completely private and completely permissioned and you need approvals for everything and you even to look at the records and that's something that governments would really like. Now, that's completely opposite to decentralization, but if you are going to use blockchain technology, it ensures that there has to be a certain level of decentralization uh, compared to the normal systems that we use today where we focus on keeping it in a central repository or a central location. So now let's move on to crypto assets because this is the most popular segment here and uh, let's just dive in by telling you what the difference is between blockchain and crypto assets. So blockchain is basically the foundation of cryptocurrencies. If cryptocurrencies were Facebook or Google, then blockchain would be the internet. So that's what makes cryptocurrencies possible. How are they different? Well, it again, blockchain is just code and cryptocurrencies are just code. So what really is different is what you're storing within that code. So if you decide to store an amount, say for example, a transaction amount, then it becomes a cryptocurrency because what you are storing under each user is how much money or how much of that asset they have to spend or send it to someone. Whereas under a blockchain, in that's under that user, you will be storing data, which is in the form of files or it could be in the form of any other, uh, you know, digital uh, format that you would like it to be. And uh, the principal difference between both of them is that blockchain is a technology and cryptocurrencies are assets. So let's just dive into some of the cryptocurrencies and uh, we're not going to talk about Bitcoin here because we have spoken most of the way, every, most of the things we've said is about Bitcoin and the rest of the currencies are pretty much derivations of it and they're more focused towards how they brand themselves. So we'll just quickly cover up Ethereum. So Ethereum is uh, a company that was founded by Vitalik Buterin in 2015 and this was touted to be the second generation of bitcoin where uh, or blockchain technology to be specific where uh, they said that look we are not only building a payments platform but on top of that we're building a virtual platform that will allow people to go ahead and create their own cryptocurrencies and smart contracts so that was called ethereum virtual machine and that's pretty much why they called it the second generation and uh, some the biggest benefit that EVM gave us were smart contracts. So what exactly are smart contracts? Smart contracts are just arbitrary bits of code. So it's just code that says that if this condition is met, then I have to run this particular operation or this function. So think of it as like a digital vending machine where you want to buy a Coke. So you go up to the vending machine and you you know, just hand the amounts, hand a $10 bill to the vending machine, the vending machine drops the Coke and you pick up your change. So there's no bargaining, there's no hasslement, there's no chance for the vending machine to say, hey, I don't want to serve it to you right now because it's my lunch time. So none of that stuff. It is completely automated and if the conditions are met, then the action will be performed. That will happen regardless of any what anyone says or what anyone does. So that creates a lot of security within businesses and we'll discuss that later, but that's pretty much what's smart contracts are they're digital vending machines meant for generic goods and services not only uh, you know consumables then there's ripple ripple was we spoke about it earlier it was founded in 2015 and finally launched in 2017 and it was focused towards creating a network of borderless payments and they weren't uh, too different from what uh, bitcoin were doing but they positioned themselves in a way that will make them a little more scalable and that's uh, 
the stark difference, but the biggest difference is how they positioned themselves. They positioned themselves as a network for banks. So they said that, hey, look, while everyone's saying that blockchain is going to kill you guys, banks, you guys come into our network and we'll make sure that you guys are still a part of this and you guys can leverage our technology and still compete with other currencies. So that's something that's interesting and revolutionary in terms of marketing. So you can we can go through a lot of cryptocurrencies throughout the day, but we're going to stop here in terms of crypto assets because uh, we can't cover all of them and that isn't the focus. Uh, but before we move on, we just like to look at how exactly these things are stored. So you can go for a third party storage, but if you're buying a cryptocurrency, you can go onto a platform that's called an exchange. So the exchange basically has these wallets or these IDs for you where you can go ahead and store the currencies. You can also store them in dedicated cold storages where you have people buying in large warehouses and keeping a lot of different people's uh, currencies offline. And you also have dedicated wallets on your phones these days, like Samsung and HTC have launched their own dedicated inbuilt cryptocurrency wallets with their phones. And you also have the personal storage, or we like to call this as offline or hard wallets. And this is our favorite form of method, and we would highly recommend this. So these kind of wallets pretty much look like small flash drives or USB pen drives that you use. They come with inbuilt two-factor authentication setup, so they're pretty secure. And you can also ensure that if you lose this particular pen drive, uh, you can easily clone it. And that's a, that's a secure way to do this. And it is very very good in terms of keeping the data and it's very efficient because you can store as much of the currency as you want like you can store trillions upon trillions of valued of bitcoins and you can just put it in your pocket and you can walk around and if even if it gets stolen if they don't know what the password is they cannot hack into it and you can pretty much cross borders with that in your pocket and no one will know it as well so now that we've covered the final part of the, you know, what blockchain technology is, now we get into the fun part where we say that how do you, how do you exactly apply this to different financial or different industries? So we'll start with the financial sector and one of the most common benefits or the, the largest benefit there is for financial institutions is cross-border payments. So current systems involve you going down to the bank, filling out a SWIFT form, getting a code, getting the information of the person you're sending it to, their account number, their IFSC code, and it requires a lot of effort from your end to just send a little bit of money to someone else abroad. So the last disruption was TransferWise. If you guys have time, you guys should look at TransferWise and what they've done. But pretty much the current system has caused a lot of hindrance to trade. It's caused a lot of hindrance to micro investments in terms of me as an individual trying to invest in any kind of asset or technology abroad is very, very difficult. Because not only do I have to know where I have to send it to, I also have to have a trusted third party do it. And every time I want to send or receive money, it's a huge process that takes days. And that just uh, kills uh, liquidity in the asset that you're investing into. So blockchain solves all of that by making all of the payments instantaneous. No matter where the other person is, all you need is their address or the URL to basically just go ahead and send the funds and they can do the same. So that's pretty much a liquid way of sending uh, money abroad. So the benefits to the individuals are that first of all, you have public records. So if you're gonna send some money to Sergey in Russia for some uh, product, you don't really need to go and worry about whether this person is legitimate, whether he's gonna do it or not. You can just look at their transaction history. You can look at what all of the people are saying uh, who have transacted with them before, and then you have all of that record available with you, and you can just do it in a seamless and secure way. Second, as we mentioned, that there's an increase in liquidity because now micro investments become a lot easier and micro transfers also become a lot easier. And finally, since there is no concept of trust in this network, you don't have to keep your trust on an entity to ensure that the funds get there. You can do that yourself and you yourself are responsible for keeping that accountability and you can just do it by simply downloading the ledger and looking at it. The benefits to institutions are vast because first of all, you have a massive reduction in middleman. So that's very, very important for businesses who are conducting uh, operations in a cross-border fashion or have operations in multiple countries. You can also use, they can also use smart contracts to create their own escrow. So they don't have to go to a third party escrow system. Instead, they say that, look, we're building the smart contract and we're keeping the funds here. If you meet the condition, then the smart contract will release the funds. It's not up to us, it's up to the code right now. And there's nothing that can be done 
other than what you've promised us. And it also becomes really easy for these guys to go ahead and start global crowdfunding because if they come out with a new project or if they come out with a new product, they can go and tell the world that, hey, just send it to this address and, uh, you know, we'll make sure that this product comes to you or the benefit gets to you. So that won't be restricted in a geographical location kind of uh, basis. What happened it is what happens today. Then let's look at blockchain applications and supply chain management. Now, this is a hot, hot topic in blockchain right now. So the first thing that blockchain does for trade in specific is that since there is a global and public record that's decentralized, you have, uh, you know, it encourages trade facilitation because now you can ensure that if you're ordering it from a particular retailer, you can go ahead and look at their previous transactions. You can look at what the people are saying and say that, okay, yeah, I do want to do this. Then you can also look at the material origin and tracking. So if you're buying a product, you can look at where the raw materials uh, used for that product came from and how exactly they've been um, manufactured. And you can even track the location of the product so you can see where exactly it's coming and that you do not, again, have to trust uh, a third party. So today you trust Amazon to tell you that, okay, I've ordered this product and it's telling me it's in the warehouse. So I have to trust Amazon because no one else has that data. So blockchain completely removes that uh, request. And finally, all of this data is completely secure and it also ensures the security of the goods in trade. So if there's any chance of uh, misplacement or lost goods, you can use blockchain to specifically track where it was before and you can ensure that this wasn't tampered with because you have the ability to go ahead and check uh, the records of other people. And this is also very important in food and safety because... Uh, we normally don't know how a kitchen operates behind closed doors. So there is the one show uh, by the celebrity chef Gordon Ramsay where he goes to fine dining restaurants and he's able to basically tell what the food is when he's being uh, served it. So he can say that whether it's been refrigerated or whether it's coming fresh. Now, it's a little bit difficult for uh, people like us to say that, but if someone with his experience of 20, 30 years, he'd be immediately catch. he'd be able to immediately catch it. So... What blockchain will allow us to do is that with the click of a button, you can see where exactly the ingredients for your dish were uh, farmed and produced and when they were delivered to this particular restaurant. So you can ensure that all of the ingredients are fresh and they're up to your liking. You can also ensure the preservation methods by looking at what are the kind of preservatives they're going in, where exactly is it stored and where is it coming from. So all of these benefits come in with blockchain in terms of food and safety. Now, the uh, supply chain management ecosystem is huge with a lot of big players in it, and you should take your time to look at who's doing what in this field. As you can see, there are big names, but we don't want to get into them at the moment. Let's move on, and let's move on to healthcare. So the first benefit is that you have standardized records for all the patients. So you, the patients pretty much go ahead and input their data in a standardized manner, and they also have access or control of that data. So they get to choose who can see the data, who can access the data, and they can also revoke that access if they choose to do so. Now, this is not only beneficial for doctors, but it's also beneficial for researchers and scientists of deadly and contagious diseases because they have a global directory to go to for fetching the data, and also they can do it in an ethical, and uh, they can do it really quickly as well. So that's really beneficial for research holistically. Then let's look at some blockchain applications in other industries quickly. So there's blockchain and energy where you can look at the consumption tracking for each and every household and individual. And again, that data is secure and public. Blockchain also allows for distributed computing. So it would be a lot easier to cool a thousand laptops with their own fans than to get a uh, hundred server farm with a large cooling tower. So the cooling requirements generally go down. And there's this company called Electrify where uh, they allow people who are generating power in their homes to sell it to their neighbors. That is the excess power that you've generated. So if you have a solar panel on your roof and you generated more power than you need, you can sell it to your neighbor and they'll pay you in um, crypto assets through the blockchain technology. So that's what Electrify is doing and we highly recommend that you check these people out. Then you have blockchain and automobiles where you can look at the ownership traceability of the particular asset. So if you're buying a car and the seller tells you that this is a second or third hand, uh, you can basically check that with the click of a button. Now, you can do that even today, but it's pretty laborious. And instead, you can just use blockchain to ensure that the person is telling the truth. In addition to just look at the ownership uh, status, you can also look at its current status. So you can look at when it was repaired. If the seller is telling you that he's just changed the tires, you can go ahead and check whether the 
tires have been changed or not. You can also look at whether it's been in a major accident. You can also check whether the car has been flooded and a lot of other features go. And you can also look at recording expenses that come into the car. And again, this data is completely secure, but because it is public, it is decentralized. So that particular seller, even if he wants to edit the data in a malicious way to just uh, fake uh, the current status of the asset, he or she cannot do so because they have to change the records of every single car owner in the world or in that particular country and that's very very difficult as you can see then you have blockchain and waste management where blockchain uh, using the payment system can create a very very attractive incentive system and then again you can go ahead and track the waste so you can say that hey look i'm giving this bottle for recycling i want to know to which plant it's going to and what it's going to be converted into and that entire tracking system can be done using blockchain now we believe that smart contracts are the silver bullet here because when you tell companies or when you tell say for example a restaurant saying that hey look we want you to adopt these adopt these innovative practices and here is the amount of money that we are paying you it is currently in escrow under a smart contract so if you ensure that you give us the recycle uh, if you give us materials for recycling this money will be released to your bank account and there's nothing that we can be we can do about it rather just give us your waste and get money for it directly and you don't have any hassles of filling out a form you don't have any hassles of dealing with an entity and you just get paid directly and that's something that's very very attractive for these businesses because they are looking to save cost in any particular way possible and they are also I would say that a lot of people are now becoming taking a more sustainable approach towards business so if this makes it convenient there would be no reason why they wouldn't join so finally let's talk about blockchain and real estate and we're going to talk a little bit more about blockchain and real estate because this is where our forte lies in specific so we talk about asset transfer and one particular term that you would have heard of is tokenization. So tokenization is nothing but taking an asset and breaking, out, breaking it up into smaller uh, packets and then representing each packet using a digital token. So that's what tokenization is. And tokenization is created just to introduce liquidity in a completely illiquid market. So that's one benefit. The second benefit is that it also gives you the ability to transfer it cross border. So you can transfer that digital representing token to any country in the world. And you don't really have to have that person come down and buy the property uh, in the legacy way that they do right now. And it will also create a global directory of all of the owners of this asset because you can go and see that how much exactly this person owns of that asset before actually going and buying it from that person. Then you have the asset history, of course. You can look at the activity tracking. So if you've given it for a lease or you've given your property for sublease, you can look at how much money has been generated, what is the data generated from all of the property management solutions that you have in place. You, can, you also have unparalleled information access in terms of a buyer. Let's say that you want to go buy a house and uh, you want to ensure that this house uh, has been refurnished uh, Recently, it's been, uh, you know, there's no maintenance that comes into play. Has, it, has there been any major damage? What are the recurring expenses in the house? All of these historical details will be available to you and you don't have to go with what the broker or the seller is telling you. You don't have to take their word for it. And finally, you can also do crowdfunding. So there are micro investments outside of REITs where it can be created through a community or a bunch of people who gather together and say that, look, we're putting this money into the pool and then we're going to collectively decide where we're going to invest this. And all of the investments can be represented by the token, which will be allowed to, which they can then use to trade or they can use to bring in new members as well. And this is, again, community driven. So even... Uh, yeah, people who are completely unrelated or people who are related can go ahead and form their own sort of pools for investing in real estate. And of course, since you're not going through a REIT or you're not going through a third party, you're omitting all of the fees in terms of investing in real estate. So that pretty much covers it for our blockchain applications. There are a lot more and we will continuously keep coming out with them. But uh, I want to talk about blockchain in India. So how exactly is it positioned right now? What's the status? So let's just dive in. So currently the regulations uh, state that there is a trading ban on crypto assets. So blockchain as a technology is not banned at all. But crypto assets or cryptocurrencies are banned in terms of buying and selling. It is not illegal to own them. It is only illegal to buy and sell them. So that's particularly what the regulations state. 
this but blockchain technology contra contrary to popular belief has a lot of usage in india especially there are a lot of state governments coming up and saying that hey look we want blockchain solutions to secure our data we want blockchain solutions to ensure that all of the digital identities are secure so the, all these tenders are happening right now as we speak in fact there is a firm based out of uh, bangalore in india called nishit desai associates who have put up a proposal to lift the regulatory ban from crypto assets and introduce uh, some regulations that will allow for this to function. So this is a very hot, hot space to watch. Uh, but if you still want to trade crypto assets in India, you can do it through a peer-to-peer -peer network that we talk about later, or you can just do it through cash directly. So you go ahead, put it in the pen drive that we were talking about earlier, and then go and give it to someone and collect cash, or you can do vice versa. Then you have decentralized exchanges like PISC. So exchange, again, is a platform where you can transfer tra trade these currencies. So normally exchanges are centralized because they're managed by a central company or an entity. Decentralized exchanges are the stock opposite where they're managed by the people who are part of the exchange. So that's the stock difference. So there, there are a lot of them and we'll speak about them in a bit. But if you do want to trade, just make sure that uh, you take necessary precautions. Make sure that your bank statements don't scream out crypto. Uh, instead, just make sure that, um, you know, it's a little subdued and you do it in small amounts. So why is there a ban? So as we've said that uh, the, the entire network is controlled by the people who are using the network. So the value of the particular token can only be defined by the people who are using it. And this creates a really difficult scenario for central governments to go and say that, okay, we devalue this entire uh, currency. They can't do that because people have to agree with them. And this isn't controlled by a central authority like our rupee is. So this is technically a solution to demonetization. Secondly, you have ease of overseas transfers where you can just go ahead and in a click of a button transfer that amount. You can even put it in a pen drive and just, you know, travel abroad and no one would be the wiser. And finally, it's also very private because again, you don't have a lot of KYC that goes on. You don't have a lot of data that goes on, but rather just addresses or URLs that are transacting with each other. So it becomes really difficult to track as well. There are a lot of big exchanges in uh, India. Uh, the largest three are CoinEx, Zepay, and UnoCoin. UnoCoin being the largest in terms of volume, but CoinEx has a lot more uh, types of cryptocurrencies involved. So these are the big three guys who are currently struggling with the regulations right now, but there are a lot of decentralized exchanges who work in India as well, like over-the-counter BTC, Verbox, localbitcoins.com, CoinMama, BizQ, and BitSquare are all decentralized exchanges that have nodes on network operations in India as well. There are a lot of Indian startups who come into play over here. There is, for example, Zebi Data that we want to particularly talk about. So these are the guys who are taking all of the asset record history and all of the digital identification of Amravati, the new capital of Andhra Pradesh, and putting it on the blockchain. So these are the guys who are responsible for it. And there's a lot more companies. There's like uh, there is Easy Remit that's using. Uh, Blockchain technology to make remittances a lot easier for insurance company uh, clients and so on and so forth. There's a bunch of them and we'd uh, love to go and talk about them, but we're over time at the moment. So we just um, want to put a stop here to this particular podcast. I'd like to thank you guys for joining us for such a long time. And uh, this is all we have for today. And uh, we hope that you've understood the underlying reason for the creation of this technology and we hope that its potential creates exciting ideas in your heads. So for those of you who would like to more, know a little more about Blogspot, just go ahead and subscribe and put a like on this comment and, you know, we'll, be, we'll keep updating you. And if you really want to know when the next uh, Blogspot uh, podcast is out, just click on the notification icon so you'll get a notification right away. So if you, and we are also hosting a real estate seminar on blockchain. So if you want to join that, you can just mail shefali at archaicsolutions.com. Or if you want to host your private seminar in the NCR region in Gurgaon, India, just go ahead and uh, mail Arca, info at archaic solutions or call uh, 994017323. Or you can just visit our website and use the code uh, WEBINAR to get a 10% discount. Well, thank you so much, guys, and take care. Bye-bye.